SBC family. I just wanted to say hi to everybody. I've really, really missed you guys and I can't wait to share a hot cup of coffee under the tent with you guys and catch up with what's been happening in your lives during lockdown. It seems like an eternity since I last seen you, but I can't wait for the opportunity to get together and share again. I also can't wait to get to be able to sing again and to worship the Lord together with you. And it's so exciting that we are able to get together again in uh, smaller groups and it is so much fun getting to catch up and to chat and to see what God has done in each of our lives during lockdown. The verse that has got me through lockdown has been Jeremiah 29 verse 11 where it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. And for me this has really been the truth. There's been days where I haven't known where the next meal is coming from where the next scent was going to come from but the Lord has been faithful through this whole time to us as a family and I just wanted to say a great shout out to him that he's awesome and he's faithful and he is our provider and I hope to see you soon take care and keep safe love you all bye 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 Hope you've been doing well. <laughs> Just remember God loves you and whatever you have done, He'll always forgive you. We've missed you guys so much um, since lockdown. Um, we're happy that we're going to be seeing each other again. Um, we've kept well during lockdown, um, despite my husband contracting COVID-19. Um, but we, we survived. God is good. He's always with us. He's proven it. Um, time and time again. So the whole family is fine. Um, hope to see you soon. We just wanted to say hello. Thank you. God bless you. Bye. Bye. Good morning, HBC. A warm hello here from the Libba household. Lockdown has been tough on all of us and uh, we just miss you all dearly and can't wait to see you all. Lord's been specially good to us also in this lockdown period. Yeah. And Lauren's got some exciting news to share. <laughs> Um, yeah, this week we celebrated Nina's second birthday, uh, which um, has been really exciting. Um, and we're also patiently awaiting the arrival of our second child, a baby boy, in November. So hopefully we'll be able to see you all soon and have coffee under the tent and you'll be able to meet the baby soon. Sending lots of love. Bye-bye. 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 <laughs> hey, everyone, and welcome to SBC Online. Today is a really exciting week because not only are we running online services, but we are running our first in-person gatherings at the church in almost seven months. Now, it's not too late for you to sign up. If you'd like to join one of those, you can head to the link on screen and we will allocate you to either the 18th or the 25th of the month. It'll be great to see your faces again. Not only is church up and running on Sundays, many of our small groups are also gathering again. And if you would like to be a part of a small group, um, you can contact Mark and he will help you to find one that will fit right for you or your family. Regarding Next Gen Ministry and our Friday programs, we're still feeling our way forward there and we'll keep you updated as we have more information. Right now it's time to dive into the rest of our service as we continue our journey of getting ready to gather. And Joey will be bringing us God's word today. You're invited to stay on to worship in song afterwards, as well as you can worship the Lord through giving today um, by using the bank details on the screen. Or you can worship the Lord by sharing an answered prayer or a testimony or even a scripture in our comment feed and encourage um, your further brothers and sisters with what God is doing in your life. Have a great service, everyone. Morning, church. Morning. So glad you're joining with us today. Can you believe it was the 14th of March that we last met in our church building? And that's happening again this morning. We are really excited to be able to restore fellowship like that. Actual seeing human beings next to each other. Uh, we're so delighted that the time has come when we can do that again. We'd love you to join us. But if you're not joining us there this morning and you're here instead because of geography or perhaps because of your health concern, concerns about the virus, you're so welcome. And we're delighted to still be able to offer online services. I've asked Ali to read a passage for us this morning that's just going to tell us a little bit about the excitement of remembering and getting back together. From Philippians 1. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I will always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. 
So while we're still doing virtual services, let's pray together and ask the Lord to speak to us through his word as we listen this morning. Lord, we're so grateful, so excited that uh, Real Church back at uh, SBC campus is happening this morning. And yet, through your divine grace, this is no less real. We can listen to your word. Your Holy Spirit can speak to us. We connect with each other as we hear your word and respond to your teaching. So Lord, we pray that today the voice of your Holy Spirit would be clear in our hearts, that our hearts would be open to receive, to listen, to learn, to put into practice, to be changed as we come under the preaching of your word. Thank you for this time. We pray that it would be instructive, useful, and a wonderful blessing to each one. Thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Enjoy the service. Thanks for joining us. Sterling and welcome to another online service. It's great to have you with us, particularly if you are joining for the very first time. We this morning are going to be continuing on our series called Getting Ready to Gather. The series is based off the, our foundational text, which is Acts 2, 42 to 47, which gives us a wonderful picture of what the early church looks like. And it shows in that text that the early church gave themselves to four things. They gave themselves one to the apostles teaching, two to the fellowship, three to the breaking of bread, and lastly to the prayers. And so that's what we're going to be looking at. That's going to be our structure as we go through the next couple of months unpacking this wonderful, wonderful text. And two weeks ago, Matt kicked the series off as we started looking at the apostles teaching by talking about the need for us to to devote ourselves to it. Last week, we looked at uh, the authority of preaching and in light of that, what is our response to it and how should we act in light of preaching? Um, And this morning, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the importance of scripture to the individual, into our own personal lives. And how we're going to achieve this uh, goal is we're going to be looking at four things. We're going to be looking at what is scripture? What is the word of God? Now, I know we did that last week. But for many of you, I'm sure you missed it um, or you just need a refresher. And it's so important that we grasp this because we're going to it's going to be a foundation for the rest of our sermon this morning. Um, But then after that, we're going to look at why is it important that we hold on to this truth and guard it. Then we're going to look at, well, if we do apply this to our lives, uh, what are some of the benefits for the believer who does it? And then lastly, in light of all this information, how does it change our approach to Scripture? So let's start off with our very first section. What is Scripture? Well, when we look at 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, it says this about the Scripture. It says, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction and for training in righteousness. The man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God. And in some way, scripture is produced by God. Just as the heavens and all of the universe were spoken to being by God, were breathed uh, out of his mouth, as Psalm uh, 33 verse 6 says, so the written word of God is breathed out by God, the Holy Spirit. And as the various writers wrote their various texts, the Holy Spirit ensured that whatever they had written, that the end product was exactly what he wanted. Now, what that doesn't mean is that they fell into some kind of trance or they heard it dictated out loud and and they they wrote down uh, so much uh, that wouldn't have happened for all of them. But it, the men were fully awake. They're fully aware of what they were writing. They uh, wrote to a certain people in a certain context. And as they wrote it, uh, the Holy Spirit guided their thoughts so that they made sure that the end product was the way he wanted it. So this is not man's thoughts with some divine inspiration sprinkled on it, but rather that this is the very inspired 
word of God. And as a result, we can be sure that as this is spoken by God, that it is trustworthy. And we see this in John 17, verse 17, when Jesus praying to the Father, says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And what's interesting here is that he doesn't use the um, adjective true, but rather he uses the noun truth. And what that means for us, and it has some big implications, is that the biblical truth is not uh, just true in that it uh, it conforms to some higher standard or final standard of truth, but rather biblical truth is the final standard of truth. So that means that scripture becomes our guide. The written word of God becomes a guide for our life and nothing is to believe about God and about, uh, um, about, and about him uh, except if it is in harmony with scripture. And so there are many voices out there in the world who are trying to speak on behalf of God and say God has spoken to them. Unless it lines up with scripture, we do not hold to it. We cast it aside. It's, we do not take it seriously because the word of God is the very spoken word of God. But also it has an implication to mean that God's word is relevant for us now. It has been written so that we might be able to live it out now. And that's what we're going to be speaking about this morning. The importance of God's word is that it's not this ancient written text that has no relevance for us now, but it's super important. We uh, see in Hebrews 4 verse 12, it says, for the, the word of God is living and active. It's alive. It's active. And so it's not dead. It's not irrelevant. It's not aged, but it is living and active and just as important as it was thousands of years ago when it was penned. So it is important for us now in our lives. And it has not changed. God has not changed his mind. His word is permanent and true always. And we see this in Psalm 119 verses 84. It says, forever, O Lord, your word is firmly fixed in the heavens. So this wonderful truth that the scripture that we have, this Bibles that we have, are the very words of God available to us to make impact in our lives. And so it's trustworthy, it's relevant, and it's authoritative over our lives. And so as we move to our second point here, that we need to hold on and guard to it, it is essential that we as believers and as the church believe this about the word of God, that we hold on to it, we cling to it, we guard it with our lives because this is the very truth spoken to God to us. And, uh, and we see this with Paul. He, he found this important too. He made much of the truth of his message and the need to get it exactly right, even if the minister who ministered it was not exactly right himself. An example of this would be in Philippians 1, Paul being in prison, right to the church of Philippi and says, well, man, there are those who are trying to inflict harm on me by preaching the gospel. And I just want you to know that I'm happy that they are doing it because Christ is being proclaimed. The me true message of God is being spoken. So even though that the motive was, is wrong, man, I, I'm okay with it because Jesus is being proclaimed and people are hearing Christ. Now, on the contrary, on the uh, on contrast that we we see Galatians one, where Paul opposes his enemies by placing a curse on them because they got the message wrong. The Judaizers, Judaizers were were preaching a wrong message. They were saying that the works of the flesh would finalize and finish the justifying work of faith by the Spirit. And it might have seemed trivial to the church because the Judaizers and Paul held so many precious truths together, but they disagreed on this one and Paul cursed them for it. It was not trivial. And for us, it is so incredibly important that we hold on to the truths of Scripture. This is the very word of God. We guard it. We believe it. We act it out and we hold on to it. Um, because really what is at stake is the fact that uh, the extension of God's church and the health of the church. And locally, our church, but also the universal church. And so we need to hold on to the very words of Scripture. But not just its words, but the meanings of the words. Uh, there are those who will use very similar words to us, if not the exact same words that we do, but mean vastly different things. For example, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints Mormons, they hold and use a very similar vocab to us, but the meanings of those words are different. So if you speak to Jehovah's Witness and you say, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, they will go, me too. 
But for us, we believe Jesus is the eternal Son of God, uh, um, co-equal with the Father, where uh, Jehovah's Witnesses will believe that he is a created being, Michael the archangel, and, and, and there's many complications there, but, but the words are the same, but vastly different meanings. And, and that is important for us to understand. We need to guard the meanings and the truth that Scripture preaches. And now while those are extreme examples, they are also, uh, that also creeps into the church. The, even, even, even into the so-called evangelical church, it creeps in. There are many who have changed the, the meanings of words in order to make the truth of the gospel more palatable to the unsaved world. And their hope is that they'll bring in the lost and people will like what they hear and stay, kind of like what we spoke about last week, getting our ears tickled. The message is changed in order to satisfy who they are. But the problem is that they are getting saved into a Christianity that is not of Scripture. And, and so it is so important that we as a church hold on to these truths. Now, Having said that, I've got to give us some courage and, and some hope and comfort is that the, the state of the church and, 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 and the way she progresses and her survival is not dependent on us. It's not dependent on you and me, but it's dependent on the sovereign work of God. And he promises to keep her and sustain her. But the extent in which she grows and reaches the, the world is is at stake and the glory of Christ is at stake as 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 we hold and guard this truth because if we hold it loosely and it disappears many will think they are saved into the biblical understanding of who God is and Jesus Christ but would have been saved into something else and and church history shows that there are times in church history where many would have thought they were part of the church but they had a, a horribly wrong understanding of Christ, that he was just a man and not God. But their God sustained the church through faithful men who hold to the truths of Scripture and fought hard for it and guarded that uh, for the glory of Christ. And as a result, because of their faithfulness, you and I are able to hold on to the truths of Christ because of their faithfulness of doing it. Now, you might be saying, but Joe, aren't we meant to be looking this morning at the importance of holding on to uh, Scripture in the individual's life? And, and you're right, and we are, and this is how it connects, is how can we guard uh, the truth? How can we fight against false teaching? How can we proclaim the truths of Scripture if we do not know what it means? How are we able to be aware of wrong if we do not know what is right? How can we be aware of false if we do not know what is true? And so there's an incredibly importance that we understand what Scripture says in an individual's life in order to guard against it. And even if we had to take that down to a micro level of not necessarily guarding the church, but even guarding yourself as an individual, Paul says we should do that in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 13. He says, be watchful and stand firm in the faith. Be watchful. Watchful of what? If you don't know what to be watchful for, how can you watch out for it? If, if it's stand firm in the faith, what is your faith? Do you have a biblical foundation for your faith or is your faith something that you've just been taught and never found from scripture yourself? Because how can we uh, tell an unbelieving world that scripture is true? How can we convince the skeptic that scripture um, uh, that, that, that scripture is infallible if the, there is no centrality to Scripture in our own hearts. If Scripture is not important to us and has no major impact on our lives and is not central to our lives, how then can we argue that to others that they must devote themselves to it? For life is found in here. If it does not change our lives, how can we ask others uh, to take it seriously? And so it's so important that we understand the truth of God in, in order to guide ourselves but also that we might proclaim this message as this message is true. Scripture needs to be central to us. This is where we need to start. This is where we need to start. And if we do that, I'm going to move to or over to the benefits now, the benefits of Scripture to the believer. If we do that, there are incredible benefits to us. 
So not only is it to defend the truth for the, the world that needs it, the lost world that needs to know it, but also it is an incredible benefit to us. And it only makes logical sense that it has benefit to us. Because if this is the very spoken word of God in which we hold to and believe, then it can't speak into us by the power of his Holy Spirit through scripture, then it should have major benefits on our lives. And we see an example of what this would look like in this wonderful imagery in Psalm 1 verses 1 to 3. It says, Blessed is the man who delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Wonderful picture of a person who devotes themselves to this wonderful word of God. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields fruit in season and its leaf does not wither. Other passages break that down a little bit more clearly for us um, and show us maybe a little bit more practically in a little bit more detail on what it means. Firstly, scripture becomes our guide. It's our guide. Psalm 119 verses 105 says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet a light unto my path. In the midst of uncertainty and in the lack of clarity, scripture helps us to know what to do and where we should go. In the darkness and phase and mistiness of life, scripture brings a light into our path to show us how we should act and where we should go. This is a wonderful thing. But often what scripture does is it it doesn't give us a five or 10 year plan as much as we wanted to do that. It gives us the next step or the next couple of steps if we are lucky. And so what happens is we know what the next step is, but we kind of continue run to scripture to find, okay, I've, I've, moved, I've moved forward here, but where do I go next? And there's this constant need to run to scripture to find a guide. But if we do that, scripture is a sure and certain guide on life, on how we should live it and where we should go. The second benefit is that it keeps us pure. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. Uh, Let me uh, just uh, stop and point out the effectiveness of scripture here. Who does scripture in this particular case say that it keeps its pure? It says that young men. Now that's not saying it doesn't keep it for everybody else. But let me just point out the obvious that young men are the least likely to keep their ways pure. Young men are the most uh, uh, most likely to fight against authority over their lives. Young men are the most likely to pursue after passions and the lust of this world and to forsake anything that is pure. Young men are probably the most individualistic and think about themselves more than anyone else um, in the human race. Young men are the least likely to take spiritual things seriously because they feel that they're invincible, that they've got their whole lives ahead of them and they're going to live for themselves now and maybe, just maybe, they'll take things of God seriously later. But yet the effectiveness of scripture is that it is even able to make the most unlikely pure. It is able to make the most unlikely pure. And that's the effectiveness of scripture on your life and in mine. And a little later on, two verses later, it says, I have stored up the words, your words in my heart that I uh, might not have sinned against you. That's Psalm 119 verse 11. Where does this store it up? In the mind? No, in the heart. And this is important for us to understand that scripture and reading scripture is not just an intellectual exercise. It certainly has an aspect of that. We grow in our knowledge. We, we learn things, but it cannot just stay in our heads. It needs to filter from our heads down into our hearts. It, I stored it up in my heart and I might not sit against you. The heart needs to become pure. Um, And the heart in scripture is the centrality of the personality. It needs to change us. It needs to, we need to be different. And and that's, that's important to realize as well, is that purity is not just an outward act, but it's something that takes place inside us. We change. Scripture changes us. It makes us pure. And now while that is certainly desirable to be righteous and pure is something that should be desirable to us, the implications and result of that is even more desirable. Listen to Matthew 5 verse 8, the second, uh, the sixth beatitude, it says, 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. This beatitude insists that it is vitally important that we are pure so that we might be able to see God. Now, Christ has come and set us free from sin. He is, we have his righteousness on us. We have new hearts in Jesus. The old is gone. The new has come. Um, and so we can have a relationship with God. But now that we are Christian and saved and can walk into the presence of God as we pursue after holiness and purity, that as sin gets taken off us we are able to grow in our understanding of him and see him more clearly and to enjoy him more um, other passages in scripture say the psalm 24 verses 3 and 4 says you sh- who shall ascend the hill of the lord and who shall stand in his holy place he who has uh, clean hands and a pure heart the writer of hebrews puts it like this he says strive for holiness without uh, which no one will see the lord hebrews 12 verse 14 and so we devote ourselves to scripture so that we might be purified which is desirable in and of itself, but ultimately, because we know as that happens, we will see God more clearly. We will have a greater fellowship with Him. We will enjoy Him more. We will be, uh, be we'll be able to e- encompass and, and know Him far more clearly. With sin being cast off daily, our fellowship will, with Him will grow drastically. What a benefit! I don't want to lose this out. That is an incredible benefit for the believer who is made pure through scriptures that we get to know and enjoy God more. Wow. The the third one is that it comforts a a, a sorrowful heart. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 50 says, This is my comfort in my affliction, that your promise gives uh, me life. Even in the midst of trial, and hardship and difficulty, Scripture is able to comfort us. You see, the Holy Spirit who illuminates Scripture for us, who applies Scripture to us, is also called our comforter. And He is able to take Scripture and and apply to our hearts in the midst of trial, sorrow and difficulty, so that He can comfort us. And and, and those of you who, who have spent time in God's Word will know this truth, that you could just be reading God's Word and, and something that you've read before or something that you just know suddenly becomes so meaningful to you and comforts you even in the midst of affliction. Like, you know God is your provider, but yet as you read it in the midst of a financial difficulty, oh man, that comforts your heart. God graciously, personally takes his word and comforts you in the midst of sorrow. Verse, uh, the the next one, uh, the fourth one is, it gives us hope. Uh, Psalm 119 verses 114 says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. I hope in your word. The more we devote ourselves to scripture, the more we become people who are sturdy. Um, Even in the midst of difficulty and hardship, we have a sure foundation of hope. Jesus explains it like this in in Matthew 7, verses 24 to 27. He gives us a story I'm sure you would have heard in Sunday school before. He says there are two men. One goes and takes the easy route by building a house in the sand. Um, He goes and he builds his foundations are easily up. He goes and he builds his house there. And the other man, however, takes the more difficult routes. He builds his house on the rock. Can you imagine trying to get the foundations ready for that house? However, the results are different. When the floods came, and if you remember, we spoke a while back in our Songs of Salvation series about the Negev. The Negev is a, a place that uh, floods, a massive floods, uh, and just wipes out everything. It's this desert plain. This is the imagery here. Suddenly the floods come. That house is built on sand. doesn't stand a chance. It collapses. The house is built on the rock. Even though the floods came and the waters rise, it does does not go anywhere. It stands still. It's it's firm. It's sturdy. And Jesus says, the same will be for those who hear and do his word. That we will be firm. We have a firm foundation. We have a firm hope in the word 
of God. Now, the hope that we talk about, a biblical hope, is not like we often refer to. I hope that the rain is going to come and keep on coming because we need to fill our dams and the drought will be over, right? And the farmers will get the water they need. That's the hope we have. But it's there's an uncertainty behind it. It's, it's a wishful thinking. The hope that talks about in Scripture is something that is sure and will happen. Why? Because Scripture is true and it is trustworthy. And so when we have a hope, it's not, I hope it's just uh, that it will come, but we are so certain that it's a different type of a, of a hope. This is the hope that we have. And as a result, when the trials come, the difficulties come, we have an incredible hope in the word of God because we know it is true and what it is telling us. We hold on to the promises of God. But, and I must just say this at the end of this point, is that it will only have this hope as much as we spend time knowing the word of God. And hearing it and applying it. You can't have this hope if you don't listen to it or apply it to your lives. The next one is, and we'll finish off, uh, we'll, get, uh, we'll finish off with this one or maybe another two, is that it equips us to live for God. It equips us to live for God. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, we are his work, we are his result of his work, creating Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should work in them. This is this wonderful truth that God has created us in Christ to have a work. We are, he has given us good things to do. He has planned this before the foundations of the world that you and I in Jesus will do things for his glory and in here we will find a purpose. However, if we are to be equipped for this, we need to devote ourselves to Scripture. As 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And so if you and I are wanting to live out the purposes that God has for you and me, if you and I are wanting to have a life that is uh, has of eternal importance that we can stand before God and hear well done my good and faithful servant because we have fully achieved all that God wants for us by being equipped for it we need to at least be devoted to scripture because scripture by the power of the Holy Spirit comes and equips us to do the work of God Holy Spirit uses scripture so that we might be equipped to do the things that he has planned for us to do before the foundations of the world and lastly we'll make this one quick it makes us wise Psalm 100 uh, so I'm sorry Psalm 19 this time verse 7 says the testimony of the Lord is sure making simple the wise. The world is at the moment in absolute chaos, full of stupidity and foolishness to say the least. And there are tons of voices shouting out all this foolishness on media, social media, uh, around us all the time that are vying for our attention. But scripture gives us wisdom and clarity amongst all the noise. It makes us wise, it makes the simple the wise. So those are the benefits. So what happens uh, now that in light of all of this, we know that the word of God is true, that we need to hold in God onto it and all these benefits of those who do it. How does this change the way we approach scripture? Well, firstly, it changes the way we read and respond to it. Uh, we read it daily. We read it as often as we can, as, as, as best as we can daily. Uh, Matthew 4 verse 4 says, Man cannot live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Suddenly, if we understand that this is the very spoken word of God and has this incredible benefits for me, how can I live without it? I need it as much as I need bread. I need the word of God. And when we realize that we have the opportunity to hear from God on a daily basis and it has such implications for me, I want to do it as best as I can. I want to do it as often as I can. I want to do it first thing if I can. I want to spend time in the word of God. And if its benefits are true, that it will make me a, 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 a tree that is planted by streams of water and not the fluff, that it will be able to apply to my lives as often as I can, I will strive to do so daily. And, and if, I, if, if I can't, for whatever reason, uh, read it that day. I still meditate upon it. I've, 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 I've memorized scripture. I quote it to myself. I pray through it. I ask God to speak to me to it. I praise him as I recall with scriptures about him. I make sure I don't go through a day where scripture it does it not at least have an impact 
on my life. I want to meditate on it. And even if I haven't had a chance to read, we see that in Psalm, Psalm 1. He, the blessed man is the man who meditates upon it day and night. He, while he's working, as he's going, he's thinking through it. So even if we can't read it for that day, we make sure that we are thinking about it and applying it to our lives. And as I say that, I know the difficulty of that. Let me just speak as a pastor even. There are challenges and it's tough to, to commit to reading to as, uh, God's word. It is hard. I too, as a pastor, maybe I can't speak for other pastors, but I too wake up in the morning when it's dark and it's cold and I want to stay in bed and go to sleep. But even as I prepared for these last two sermons and I reminded myself of this wonderful truth yet again, I have had the encouragement of going, Joe, you need to sleep, you're tired, you can do this later. And I go, no, no. But man, this is the word of God. This is God's word. God speaks. This is alive. This is true. God speaks to me. And I want to hear from him. Today, there's a possibility that he's going to shape me, that he's going to guide me, that he's going to comfort me, that he's going to encourage me. He's going to reveal himself to me. He's going to show me Christ. I can't miss this. I got to get up. And if I'm honest to myself, I'm just going to not listen to my snooze button. And I'm going to lie there waiting for my snooze button and listen for it rather than get any sleep anyway. So I'm going to get up and I'm going to spend time with God's word. Having a right view of scripture and what it is and, and the benefits of it and what God is going to do through it. It encourages us to do it. it. Encourages us to do it as often as we can because man, there is life in it and we want it. The second implication is that it changes the uh, it changes the way we read it. We read it in order to hear God. If this is God's spoken word, I'm not coming to read it so that I might get through my reading plan and check it off some religious activity. But rather I come in order that I might hear from God himself. That I might hear him speak to me. That's what I want. I want to hear from God. And so that that means, one, that I pray like crazy before. That I, I, I go, Lord, this is your word. And if you do not speak to me through it, I'm wasting my time. I, I want it. Holy Spirit, will you come and illuminate God? Would you illuminate your words? Will you show me what you want to speak? Lord, I'm desperate for you. I, I, I need you. I'm dependent on you. I need you to come through. And we pray like crazy that God will show, him, uh, show us what he's speaking to, uh, uh, through his, speaking to us through his word uh, so that we do not waste our time. And two, I, I'm not satisfied if I do not hear from God. If I'm convinced that this is the, the very spoken word of God, that it's living and active, I am not satisfied that when I've come to the end of my reading plan, that I have not heard from him. I, I realize then there must have, there's, I, I need more. I, I need to reread again. Or I have read for the sake of reading. My heart wasn't right. I didn't pray beforehand. I, I realize that there is something living and active here. And I, I, and I do think sometimes God says, how much do you want this? Do you really want to hear from me? Or must I always give it to you on a platter? And, and, and when we desperate and desire and need, like Matt spoke about in week one, want the word of God. Man, if I have not heard, I'm not satisfied. And so I, I meditate upon it. I ask God again, show me what I have to hear. Now, I realize we all have time schedules. I too, I have to get up at some point, get ready, get my son ready, take him to school, get to work on time. But that does not mean I give up at some point. I, I can meditate and pray about it. I can do research. I can study. I, can, I need to figure this out. I don't understand. The scripture is hard to get. And I, I realize that. But we've got to search and pursue after. The apostle Peter says it about Paul's writing. He says, oh man, some of this is difficult to understand. That's Peter. And yet we are to understand it and, and, and pursue God and ask him to give it to me. Don't let it disappear. And, and I just want to say in this point, though, that's the benefit of having other Christians and doing life together. Acts 2, 42 to 47 wasn't something that was done by itself. It was done together. It was done with others. And they could ask the questions. And, and as they did fellowship together, they grew together and, and, and shaped each other. And someone who knew something that the other person didn't, they could share it. And they helped each other grow. We'll be speaking about that more next week. But there's some real benefits to our private walk with God by having others with us. 
And, and, and the last thing I want to say, Andrew, we need to hear from God, is it means that we do not just skim over Scripture to get to the devotion. I know many of us have devotions that we read, and they, they are beneficial, they help guide, uh, help us understand, they, they can be really helpful to us. But the danger is we just read the little verse on top and then jump in to hear from the writer. But if we are convinced that this is the very Word of God, we dwell on the Word of God because we want to hear from God and not from man. Man is more of just something to add on to. It is not, um, it's not to be the primary thing at all. And then, and then the third thing is under or how it changes us. We become here. Uh, we become hearers that do, and not just hearers. We become doers of God's word, and not just hearers of God's word. If if we believe this is God's spoken word to us, and the Holy Spirit illuminates something to us and challenges us or calls us to something, I understand this that or this Almighty God has spoken to me, and therefore I cannot but not listen, that he has taken time to personally apply his word to my life. I have to listen to it. I have to listen to it. And blessed is the man who is not just a hearer of the word of God, but a doer. We see this in Luke 11 verses 28. It says, blessed rather are those who hear the words of God and keep it and keep it. And lastly, I'm going to encourage you to find yourself a good translation. Find yourself a good translation. Unfortunately, there are there is this there's this movement at the moment going around called uh, the Reformation, um, the New Apostolic Reformation, and they essentially are mystics. They have this idea that they are getting they uh, God has reinstituted instituted again the apostles like in the past with the, that same authority apostles of big A, and so for when they speak, they speak on a similar authority to Scripture as a whole. And so I want you to do, if you can, do some research, find out who those are, stay away from them. But they have, one of their main guys has put out a new translation, which uh, is not a translation at all. Any academic out there would tell you it's not a translation. It's not even a paraphrase, which the message would be classified at. Um, it's, it's not even close. It's 50% longer than the original scriptures um, and, and New Testament. Uh, and it's called the, passage, uh, the Passion Translation. And I just want to warn you there, find yourself a good translation. Stay away from it. I know that translation sounds good. It sounds it's fluffy. It sounds nice. It makes it all good. But they've written, it has been written in order to push its own, own agenda. It's written by one man, which has a whole lot of problems, in order to push its own agenda. And, and you can do some research into it, but I, I really encourage you to stay away from it. But find yourself a good translation. It doesn't have to be a difficult one to read. There's some or good ones that are easy to read. But to make sure if we hold to this word of God, we want to hear from the word of God and what it has to say, not some man pushing his own agenda through it. So guys, man, we hold to this being the word of God. We must hold on to it devote ourselves to it, give ourselves to it, so we might guard ourselves from falsehood, but also that we might experience all these wonderful benefits. Read it daily, read it as often as you can, make sure you want to hear from God and pursue after His hearing, and to make sure that we don't only just hear from Him, but we do it. Let us pray. Lord, we are thankful that you are, have been so gracious to us and that you have not let, left us alone, that you have left us your word, and that you speak through it today that you have not gone silent, you're not quiet in any matter or any way, but you speak with an authority, you speak through your word by the power of your spirit, and that you shape us and guide us so that we might see you more clearly, that we might become more like you and glorify your name. We are so thankful for your word by the power of your spirit that we are able to access it and know it and hear from you, we ask. And so, Lord, I pray for us as a church that we will be a church that is hearers of your word, that devotes itself to it, and that we will be doers. For the glory of Christ, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, we're going to be heading off into a time of worship now. Uh, may you focus on Jesus, praise him and glorify him in Jesus' name. Cheers, guys. Bye.
Of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of love.
a broken world around us let us be your heart oh god to the unreached and forgotten let us be your healing arms there's a task you've laid before us your voice we can't ignore you said go into the nations as your final words to a broken world around us let us be your heart oh god to the unreached and forgotten let us be your healing arms there's a task you lay before us your voice we call you high. 